Hey listeners, thanks for dropping in. I'm Christy. And I'm Melissa. And this is Buried Motives, where we dig deep into the details of some of the most gruesome dirtbag murderers. Hey listeners, thanks for joining us today. Welcome back. We really appreciate you guys listening and we appreciate you checking us out on Facebook. Speaking of which, we just posted some artwork that one of our fans, Tambor, made for us and it is amazing. So go check it out. So cool. We love interacting with you guys on our Facebook page. Your comments about the cases are awesome and it shows us the kind of cases you like. So always make sure to comment on the cases that you find intriguing. And you never know who might be reacting on those comments. Oh, go check out episode four. Yikes. (laughs) That was so freaky. It really was freaky. Yeah. You never know who you're going to reach. Actually, it has been so amazing to see how many people across the world that are actually listening. Yeah, we are in multiple countries. So you guys are amazing. And we really appreciate you listening and telling your friends. And if you're listening on iTunes, give us a review. Give us those five stars. It will really help us out. Okay, let's get into today's case. So today we're going to talk about a case that I was a little surprised at how little was known by most people. It's always shocking to me that there are so many dirtbags out there especially when one of those dirtbags escapes the media scrutiny and fails to attract media attention. And today's one of those cases. It is amazing how many dirtbags are out there and how many we actually don't hear about. Sometimes I hear about a remote case and I think to myself, how have people not heard about this? Yeah, it happens so often. Well, I'm excited to hear today's case then. Okay, so usually when we're doing research, we have to sift through a lot of media attention in the newspapers and online articles to get to actually the real meat of the case. And that really wasn't what happened with this one. I actually had so much difficulty even finding clips about this case. Oh, wow. So John Martin Crawford was a serial rapist and murderer who killed four women from 1980 to the early 1990s. And that's just the ones he's convicted of. There are many more that he's suspected of. And despite this, I found more news articles about his death than his actual crimes and trial. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, I wonder it was why. shocking. His treatment of his victims was particularly heinous. He would rape and torture them, then brutally murder them, sometimes dismembering the bodies afterwards. Oh, no. Does that sound like any other notorious Canadian killers that you remember from the 90s? Uh, the one that sticks out to me the most would be Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. You got it. The Ken and Barbie killers. Yeah. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka operated at the same time as John Martin Crawford, and oh. the timing of their trials actually overlapped. Oh, I wonder if that's why John Crawford doesn't have as much media attention because Paul and Carla blew up the media. It is one of the reasons that people give to why there was so little media attention given to this case or to his crimes. Interesting. So he totally flew under the radar. Yeah. Unfortunately, the other reason that's cited is racism. John's victims were all First Nations women and thought to have been sex trade workers. Like we talked about with the case last week, sex trade workers are one of those populations that are often victimized because they are less likely to report or be noticed when they go missing. And this is so frustrating that this happens. Well, and it seems even more so with First Nations women. Oh, absolutely. But it's the fact that the women were First Nations that has raised the most criticism. Sadly, it's statistically proven that crimes against First Nations women are underreported and receive less media attention, especially in the time period that these crimes took place in. Oh, I totally believe that. I could see that for sure. I believe over half of all women abducted for sex trafficking are First Nations women. Which is such a sad statistic. It seems that John had chosen the perfect population to prey upon. One of the things that sets John apart from other serial killers, and this maybe led into a little bit of the media attention too, is that he didn't seem to seek publicity. Oh, and some serial killers are totally about that. They want that media attention. He lacked the look at me drive. He killed for the sheer pleasure of it. Oh, just straight up a dirtbag. So John Martin Crawford was born on March 29, 1962 in Steinbach, Manitoba. Oh, another Canadian. His mother was unwed at the time. There are reports that his birth was very difficult, but both mother and child did not suffer any lasting physical damage because of it. Okay, interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. 
how terrible for this mom. So first of all, she goes through this horrible time to get this baby on the earth, and then he turns into a dirt bag. Yeah, yeah birth like, is not easy, but to have one where they weren't sure if she was going to live or whatever, yeah. like, it's especially terrible. And then to have him turn out like that? Sorry, mom. <laughs> Within two years of his birth, John's mother had married. His stepfather was an alcoholic taxi cab driver that frequently gambled away his earnings. John's mom was reported to have a gambling addiction as well. She frequented the bingo halls. Oh, I remember the bingo halls back in the 90s. I just can't take a bingo hall as serious gambling. I like, know, but there are some serious yeah. bingoers. I don't know what you call them. Bingo but goers? Bingo goers. <laughs> I remember that was a super fun thing for me, actually, to go to the bingo hall with my mom and all us women there with all the daubers. It was a good memory. <laughs> good memory. <laughs> and she'd always buy me a bag of chips and a pop or something. So I was like, I love to go to bingo with my mom. And did you get mom. your own card or did you have to share? Because it was serious business, I remember. Oh, no. I would, get, get, dad, I would get a few cards, but my mom and my grandma would have tons of cards. And sometimes I would, my mom or my grandma would like look over and they would daub one for me that I had missed. <laughs> you were and slacking. Was, yeah. I was amazed because they could just go through them so fast and then I would be like wait gee what <laughs> and my mom would <laughs> dop it for me after she went through like her twenty amount cards. of cards yeah. that I had good times it was a serious competition back then but mm-hmm. I don't know I when I picture a hardcore gambler it's never a bingo lady <laughs> that's true but you know what you can spend serious money on bingo so take it seriously that Ta- oh definitely saying. in some places you can probably find bingo almost every night i bet you can do it online can you do online bingo oh i don't know that would be worse though because if you just have an account and it's just taking your money oh. out you're not even seeing your money go i bet you're spending way more i bet you too so by the age of three there are reports of police being called to the family home to help find john because he had run away and this seems to have happened on multiple occasions Wait, what age? He ran away at three. He ran away at three. 1966 was a hard year for John. While playing with a cigarette lighter, he suffered very severe burns on his neck, upper chest, and one arm. These scars would be visible for the rest of his life and would be a source of teasing at school for him. Oh, because how many of these cases do we do where the kids are teased relentlessly at school? The same year at the age of four, he was sexually molested when left in the care of a babysitter. Oh my goodness. This is a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. In grade one, the following year, John had difficulties meeting classroom expectations, both academically and behaviorally. He was described as having erratic mood swings from being hyperactive one minute and silent and withdrawn the next. Hmm. His difficulties were so severe that he was held back in first grade. And there are reports that a teacher actually straight up told him that he was stupid oh no yeah could you imagine no is there signs of like bipolar yep you're gonna see it come out okay he has a very extensive mental health history but he finds unfortunate ways to cope with it oh no yeah so at the age of seven he was sexually molested again by yet a different babysitter what I know. Where were his parents finding these babysitters? Yeah. There was a higher level of trust, though, at that time. It's true. Yeah. But you think if after it happened the first time, you'd take extra care with who you chose. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I couldn't find in any of the reports of whether these people, were they just kids? Were like Who the people were? Who, who were the people this? were or what kind of sexual molestation occurred. But it's reported that he was sexually molested on two different occasions by two different people. So these two dirt bags essentially helped create another dirt bag by that's, their actions. That's right. The compounding of sexual abuse, the scarring from the lighter burns, the persistent debilitating nightmares that he had, along with his learning difficulties, led for his family to relocate to Vancouver for a time to seek medical and psychological treatment for John. So his family actually packs up and moves him from Manitoba to Vancouver to be with better doctors where he can get some help. Oh, good for them. Yeah. That's quite the move. There are only brief insights that still exist from these early assessments that were done. So his early reports are really sporadic because he switched care providers so often. And the things that he reported, sometimes he said he had a great childhood and others, it was like awful and he was always teased and bullied and things like that. So it was kind of like both ends of the spectrum of how he was viewing the world. But that's kind of how he was living too, right? If he is manic depressive or bipolar, then I could totally see that. And it was already picked up at this young age. Wow. The stay in Vancouver and the help he received there didn't seem to improve his coping skills very much, though, because at the age of 12, John had resorted to solving his problems with his fist, bullying whoever he could, and sniffing glue to escape. Yikes. Well, he must have had so much pent-up rage and anger and 
having a hard time processing those feelings of what had happened. His mother remembers John sniffing glue daily and that he maintained an almost ritualistic behavior around it. You know what? I kind of thought like sniffing glue was just kind of a saying. Like I'm shocked actually to find out that someone really had like he was addicted to sniffing glue. Absolutely. He had this whole process that he would go through where he would collect food and drinks and put it around him and then he'd dump the glue into a brown paper bag so that he could inhale it inhale it and have the fumes like more concentrated and then he would be so high that he'd actually start talking to like trees and fences wow. around him so you can really get high sniffing glue you can again, apparently <laughs> hmm. it does a lot of brain damage though it's not a good thing to do oh don't do it no it's like eating tide pods don't do that either <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not where it's so this high. would be like in the 90s, the Tide Pod Challenge right. kind of thing, the <laughs> sniffing glue in a bag. Yep. Either way, don't do it, listeners. So someone would refer to this as self-medicating. So the reason why he was sniffing glue was that he just couldn't cope with the world around him or what oh, had happened to him. So he was self-medicating. Yeah. Adults can resort to alcohol and other drugs and things where when you're 12, you don't have access to that. Yeah. Well, he gets there. He finds access to Eek. it. This addiction would quickly evolve into using other substances. As he entered his teens, he began to drink and use marijuana, LSD, mushrooms, and prescription meds like Valium, Ritalin, and Talwin. Ooh, yeah. that's a lot. It is a lot of stuff. Not surprisingly, his substance abuse would lead to other troubles. He stole cars and would run away from home repeatedly and was no stranger to the law. John would reveal to a Saskatchewan penitentiary mental health worker years later that at the age of 13, he and two other boys paid an 11-year-old girl to have sex with them. Oh, no. Yeah, they paid her $5. Five bucks! Five bucks for three boys. To to each take their turn. To each take their turn. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, no. So awful. Poor little girl. Yeah. But this would lead into how he viewed women later on. As an adult, he would reveal a firm belief that sex was something that women provided for a fee. So it wasn't that they were actually like another human being that had feelings, but if you paid the money, they had to have sex with you. So that was kind of just the purpose of a woman. That's right. To him. That's how he viewed it. Oh, dirt bag. Was he molested by women or was it, it by I men? I couldn't find who he had been molested by. It just said that he had been molested at those ages. Okay. Because normally you would just assume it's by another male, mm-hmm. right? Because that is the majority of molesters. Yeah. But maybe it was women. I'm not sure. I don't know. So psychologist reports would also reveal that it was around the age of 16 that John began to hear voices telling him to steal, rape, and kill. He would say that he believed these voices came from outer space. During one vivid hallucination, John said that it was two green topless women that spoke to him and told him what to do. That's terrifying. (laughs) And I find it interesting that it was topless women that were telling him what to do. Of course it was when you're 16. Yeah. They might be green. (laughs) It's all about the boobs, right? (laughs) Sorry. The one thing that I found really strange was he was high most of the time that this was happening. So was it just that he was high or was it that he had some underlying mental health issues that brought it on? Good point. Mm -hmm. In one therapy session, John says that when the voices spoke to him, he felt like a stronger, better person, more capable of taking charge of what he wanted. So he would actually seek out opportunities when he was high to listen to these like green topless women. The one thing that you do find out later on, though, is that when he's investigated after he's convicted of all these murders, a psychologist in the penitentiary really digs deep into were there voices telling you to do all the things that you did? And he repeatedly denies it. But but oh. at 16, he says that he follows what the voices tell him to do. That's interesting. Is it because as an adult, he knows that there wasn't really green alien women telling him what to do? So he's rationalizing it? Maybe. Or it's that he knew to work the system. If he told them that voices were telling him to kill people, that they would load him up on antipsychotics, which he doesn't like having. It's actually a pattern that he has with his healthcare providers, that he purposely lies to them to avoid them prescribing antipsychotics to him because he doesn't like the way they make him feel. But he'll do all these other drugs and alter his state with those. Hmm. But the ones that the psychiatrists are prescribing for him are all ones that make him feel like dull, where all the other ones that he's taking enhance. Right. And you said it made him feel powerful to do the things that these topless green women were telling him to do. Yeah. So interesting, right? It is interesting. So when John was 19, he gave in to the voices that he had been hearing. On the evening of December 23rd, 1981, he met 35-year-old Mary Jane Sirloin in a bar in Lethbridge, Alberta. 
At 10 p.m., the couple left the bar staggering drunk, and John later returned at midnight alone. Okay. Mary Jane was found nude on Christmas Day, not far from the bar. Her breasts were described as being mutilated with bite marks. Her body had been so badly beaten that an autopsy would reveal over a liter of internal bleeding had collected in her abdomen. Oh, no. Yeah, he had beat her with a brick. Oh, my gosh. So disturbing. What a horrific fate. And it always bothers me when I hear about bite marks. That's such an up close and personal, just yeah. aggressive thing to do. It wasn't just a bite mark. It was like her breasts were mutilated with so <sighs> many bite marks. Like so probably frenzy. like chunks taken out and stuff too. And these were done before she would, had passed away. Yeah. Oh my gosh. John was an early suspect in the case because he had been the last one seen with her. Eight hours after the body had been found, John was taken into custody. So he did all this and then went back to the bar to party? Yes, he went oh. and actually went for beer and pizza afterwards. He returned at midnight. Oh. <gasps> And people put him at the bar. They knew he had left with her and then they knew he had come back. And so when they did her time of death, it was very easily like, he's your guy. And what is, like, I don't know why this popped into my head, but the sick part about this too is he would have had physical evidence of her body in his mouth Ugh. while he's drinking this beer and eating this pizza with his buds. That's such a gross thought. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. But yeah. There's all the evidence he's washing down with beer and pizza. And the poor unsuspecting friends had no idea. That's nope. what he had just done. What a dirt bag. Dirt bag. Oh my gosh. So John had originally tried to say that he had beaten the woman, but only to help her because she had started to choke. <laughs> Yeah. And okay, then he so had, make sure you have a brick handy in case your kids or any family or friends start to choke. So you can no high blood maneuver. Yeah. No J thrusting. Yeah. Just use the brick. And he also said that he had no idea how the bite marks had gotten on Mary Jane. But police used dental impressions from John to compare to the bite marks, proving definitely that he had been the one to attack her. Okay. And this is what's frustrating. Done and done. They have it. Why does he not get incarcerated right here? Why does he get the chance to do oh, it again and again? He was incarcerated two different times. Oh, but he gets out. Yeah. So on June 16, 1982, John took a deal and pled guilty to the charge of manslaughter instead of risking a trial for first degree murder. He was sentenced to 10 years and was sent to the federal penitentiary in Drumheller, Alberta. Because he said, I'll just plead guilty, he got a lesser sentence. Right. Saves them a trial. Saves them the hassle. Saves the money. John had difficulty adjusting to prison life. He started to practice self-mutilation and displayed very bizarre behaviors while he was incarcerated in Drumheller. He slashed his wrist with the hope that he would be put in a segregated unit away from the other prisoners. Oh, yeah. So he's calculating too. He's so calculating. And you'll find that out as this goes on. So because of his mental health issues, he was transferred to Saskatchewan Penitentiary in April 1984 at the age of 22 and was frequently treated at the Saskatoon Regional Psychiatric Centre. During his time there, he was given multiple diagnoses from disorganized schizophrenia, dys dyslexia, personality disorder, and drug-induced psychosis. Okay. So they had multiple reasons of why he was the way he was. It seems to fit. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for this one? Because this one I found shocking. The oh, treating no. doctor at the facility was impressed with John's cooperation and declared that he does not show any signs of former psychiatric disorder. The doctor determined that John was of average intelligence, even though he has all of this history of being below average and his teachers calling him stupid and failing yeah. grades. The doctor determined that John was of average intelligence, but seemed to experience difficulty reading and spelling, hence the dyslexia diagnosis. In regards to the conviction of murder, the doctor declared he denies having raped the victim and I do not see him as a sex offender. <gasps> John would later reveal that he had lied to that psychologist in Saskatoon because he was trying to convince the doctor that he did not need any antipsychotics. Now who's the stupid one? Yeah. Apparently, he didn't like the way that they clouded his thinking. So that's why he was lying to that oh, doctor. Oh, it makes sense. But based but that doctor, like, put those photos, those crime scene photos in that doctor's face and you tell me. Yeah. So based on this doctor's recommendations, five years after being incarcerated, John was granted day parole, but the freedom proved too much for him. And he broke the terms of his parole almost immediately and was sent back to prison. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. But he only stayed there an additional two years. What? So he didn't serve his whole 10 year. He served seven. On March 23rd, 1989, he was released from prison under the mandatory supervision of his mother. While John had been in jail, she had divorced his stepfather and had moved to Saskatoon to be closer to her son. I can't even imagine being the mother of one of these dirt pigs. No, I don't know how you would do it. 
Right? No. How you would fight that mothering instinct to try and protect your child at the same time knowing that he's this dirtbag and that somebody else needs to be taking care of him. But at the same time, the court is putting that onus back on her. And what makes her qualified to supervise this murderer? Yeah. And where do you put the limit on your unconditional love? What conditions yeah. do you have on unconditional love? You know, with how we can support support somebody without condoning what they're doing. Yeah, I don't know. It's really tricky, especially when it's your child. Yeah, so tricky. So her supervision obviously was not effective. And really, how could it be? So, yeah, so how much can a mother how do? How much control to... does she actually have over a 27-year-old? But the court releases him into her supervision. Into her so, care. So she's agreed to it then. She's agreed to it, absolutely. And she goes on to support him. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, and crazy, crazy ways of supporting him. So like just, Brian Draper's mom. Yeah. Despite arranging and taking John to multiple psychiatric treatment centers, John was spiraling. She tries to get him into treatment centers, but okay. he's 27. And if he doesn't want to go, he's not going. Between his release in 1992, John spent his time trolling the rundown areas of Saskatoon, propositioning sex trade workers in his mother's 1970 green Chevy Nova. Oh, what a piece of work. Yeah. So he's using his mom's car to, Mommy, can I borrow your car to go proposition sex workers? It gets better. Oh, this So guy. with him is his companion, Bill Corrigan. Get better friends, Bill. I'm just going to say that right now. Wait, but Bill's a piece too. Hold Aww. on. So John had met Bill while he was in Saskatchewan Penitentiary. That's why we say the supervision of his mother is not sufficient for this guy. I'm assuming she has no idea what he's doing. He probably just asked to borrow the car. And Actually, she does know about what he's doing with the car. Because in 1990, John was fined $250 when he tried to hire a sex trade worker who actually turned out to be an undercover cop. <laughs> So he got busted. His mother tried to rein him in by imposing a 9 p.m. curfew as a punishment for her then 28-year-old son. Oh, no. So she knew what he was doing with the car. But again, she thinks she's she's well, being... be home by 9, sweetie. The diligent mother. Have fun, but be home by 9. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy, right? Make it an afternoon delight instead. As you're hanging out with your ex-convict friends. Yeah. John had a reputation on the streets for being a bad trick. He was abusive and never wanted to pay full price. Despite this knowledge, he could usually find someone willing to go with him. Someone too young to know better or someone that found the lure of drugs and alcohol that he promised too attractive to pass up or ones that were already too intoxicated or stoned to resist him. Oh. So there was no shortage of women for him. And that's so sad. And this was not like a once in a while. This was like a, a daily ritual for him. Oh, I'm sure it's becoming an addiction for him. Yeah. On April 9th, 1992, Janet Sylvester, a 36-year-old First Nations woman, reported that John had raped her. Police went to investigate and found John on Paradise Beach, almost dead from substance abuse and sunstroke, with a temperature of 110 degrees. So he had passed out in the heat. They should have left him on the beach. Yeah. He was arrested, but later released on a $4,000 bail into his mother's care. So oh. his mommy pays $4,000 to get him out on bail. Unfortunately, Janet it never showed up for court and the charges were stayed. He never gets charged for the rape. That's really unfortunate. She was probably terrified. Oh, I'm sure she would. There are so many reasons why these women don't actually go through with the charges. It was probably a huge deal for her to even report to the police. Yeah, most rapes go unreported. Yeah. So shortly after his release on bail, John checked himself into a local hospital because he was depressed and couldn't sleep. He had spent the previous days binging on paint thinner, marijuana and alcohol. I don't know if his mom had convinced him at this time or if he actually recognized that something was going on. But there is some evidence here that he wasn't spiraling so much that he didn't recognize he was a danger. Right. He willingly went to the he hospital. He willingly checked himself into a local hospital. Okay. He only stayed a short time. Because he had signed himself in, he had the ability to leave whenever he chose to. <laughs> you know what I was just thinking? Why couldn't the universe... At this moment in time, connect him with one of those nurses who kill. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Problem solved. Come on, universe. It's amazing how many cases of nurses that will actually kill people. Kill people. Yeah. That they but feel how come it never happens it? when someone like a dirtbag like this comes into the hospital that yeah. they he could become their victim. So true. To help prevent all the other victims from <laughs> becoming victims. Sorry. That just no, popped that's into okay. my head. <laughs> So he ends up signing himself out of the hospital. He doesn't stay very long. Okay. Not surprising. Yeah, not surprising at all. As the summer of 1992 came into full swing, so did John's appetites. By that time, he was sniffing glue again and drinking very heavily. He drank a 24 case of beer and a 26 bottle of hard liquor a day. Holy cow. Along with sniffing glue. Oh my gosh. So he is... 
using quite heavily. He's got quite the tolerance too then. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a big guy. Go look at a picture of him. It takes a lot. Yikes. Yeah. And if you've been drinking and doing these things since you were 12, you would have a tolerance built up. Right. John's becoming more and more obsessed with his daily rituals of drugs, alcohol, and sex. He would spend his evenings picking up sex trade workers and making them do whatever he wanted. And when they wouldn't, he would beat them to comply. Ugh. Two women would later come forward and say that it was during these summer months when John had strangled them until they were unconscious and then raped them. Oh. Neither woman had reported what had happened to them to the police, only coming forward after John had been accused of murder. Okay. And that does happen. It they happens get the, all the time. the courage afterwards. Because mm -hmm. then they're not alone. Mm -hmm. On October 1992, John took part in the beating death of an unknown man and attempted to murder another man because he had been refused a cigarette. Oh my gosh. So his temper was just over the top. As a result, John spent most of 1993 in the Saskatoon Correctional Center. And this is probably the best thing that could have ever happened because as we discuss the murders that John commits, you're going to see it's right in the middle of John's murdering spree. And so he actually gets picked up and arrested for another attempted murder and he's thrown into jail and it actually stops him from continuing his rampage. Oh, that's good because he sounds pretty volatile. Yeah, he's super volatile. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to tell you when they found the bodies because they don't actually know when he picked them up. Okay. Because it's recalled by victims that he attacked that lived, um, Bill, the ex-convict, mm. and by affidavits or statements made by John himself. But most of them were under the influence at the time. And so their recollection of dates um. and the timing of things is not very reliable yeah reliable at all but i'm going to tell you when they found them and then i'll take you back to his kind of confessions and that okay. will go through what he did to the women okay yeah. fair enough so on october 1st 1994 a local hunter was out deer spotting with friends when he came across a human skull with dark hair and numerous other bones near moon lake golf course and paradise beach Reluctant to be involved with the police, the hunter waits until late at night to report it. But when police what? learn, yeah, well, he That's just weird. I think it's just they didn't want any involvement with the police. They didn't want hmm. if you found a skull, would you not be a little bit fearful of oh, maybe they'll think it was me or something? No, my For, first instinct would be to call the cops. Call the cops. So I find a skull with some hair on it. For whatever reason, this guy is a little bit hesitant to call the police and he waits a few hours. OK, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. But when police learn of the skull and investigate, they discover over 90% of a human body is present at the site. Throughout the month of October, two more skeletal remains are found within a 60 meter radius of the first. Two of the bodies have been left out in the open, and the third is found wrapped in a blanket with orange electrical cord. A Ooh, detail. That gave me a terrifying image. With the electrical cord or the blanket? Yeah, just the body wrapped in a blanket and then wrapped up in cord. Yeah. It reminds me of like what you would set up as a Halloween prop. Yeah. Ooh. And this is October. <gasps> ooh, double ooh. Yeah. The details of the cord and the blanket are actually never released to the public. And it's oh. actually how they'll catch John. Oh. The piles of bone are soon identified as three missing women. Shelley Napope was a pretty 16-year-old that had been born into the One Arrow First Nation. Her family had been the target of vandalism on the reserve because of her father's job, and they had lost their home because of it. When she moved to Saskatoon eight years prior to her disappearance, Shelley began to act out and rebel against her parents and caregivers. She spent time in and out of foster homes and was a troubled teen who had made friends with people who supplied her with drugs and alcohol. And so Aww. she began to, uh, to work the streets. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Ava Tasep was from the Yellow Quill First Nation. She had come from a strict family and had rebelled also as a teenager. After running away from home multiple times, she and her boyfriend would have four children in quick succession. She would later surrender them to her family members amid the pressures of raising the family alone when her boyfriend left her. Ava found herself working in the sex trade in Saskatoon as well. Aww. And then Catalinda Waterhen, a Cree woman, she had a troubled past too, had given birth to a daughter less than a year earlier at the Pine Grove Correctional Facility. She was released from prison shortly after the birth, but it had been reported by her father that her time in jail had negatively affected her mental health. And within a week of her release, she left her infant daughter in the care of her own parents and moved to Saskatoon to earn money as a sex trade worker. So all these poor women have had such a rough start already. Yeah. And then what a terrible way to end. And they were so vulnerable. So sad. All three women had been reported missing by their families to the police multiple times. And one of them was like over 30 times that their family had reported oh, them wow. missing in the two years. 
Wow. With finding the three women's bodies so close together with similar patterns of injuries, it became evident to the police that they had a serial killer in the area, and they began looking for a suspect. It didn't take them long to find one, thanks to Bill. Oh, Bill's a does Bill tattle? Friend. Yes. Every serial killer needs a tattletale friend. Yeah. A year earlier, in 1993, Bill had started to act as an informant to the police for various petty crimes, and he had earlier reported in that year a crime that he had witnessed between a supposed character named Potter, a name that he made up, and a woman, Angie, that had been murdered. So he draws the map out for the police of where to find this body, and the police actually go to investigate, but... They never actually find the body there. And so they just kind of wrap it up to, oh, it's just Bill. Because oh, okay. Bill's quite the, the drug abuser as well. Right. That's true. Mm-hmm. I wonder if he was reading Harry Potter at the time and that was the first name that came into Maybe. his mind. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who knows what's going on in Bill's mind? He's a little bit shady of a character He's probably himself. not the type of guy that's sitting down to read Harry Potter at <laughs> Yeah, <night>. probably not. <laughs> Now, that same investigator, though, that Bill had told his story to, he remembers the story because the remains that they actually just found are close to the map where he had drawn. Oh, so maybe he just got the map wrong. The investigator that's working on digging up these human remains is like, wait a minute. This guy a year earlier told me that there was Angie buried out here. And so they track Bill down and start to question him right away. And were the remains about a year old? Like, had they said how long ago they thought? They figured that they had been there within the last two years. (gasps) Oh. Yeah. It wasn't long before John Martin Crawford was their prime suspect, and they put him under surveillance. Because so little evidence had been recovered from the bodies due to the length of exposure to the elements and the animal activity on the bodies, and I don't know why, mm-hmm. but it always disturbs me so much when they say that there's animal activities on the bodies. Yeah, but it's when they've been so out degrading. there for that long, there usually is, unfortunately. Yeah. The police knew they would need an airtight case that would need to include a confession or catching John in the act to be able to get a conviction. Because they didn't have a lot of physical evidence to actually go on. And how risky, like catching him in the act. So risky. And there's a lot of controversy that's actually raised from people writing books after the fact of like the tactics that the police use. Yeah, that doesn't seem cool. Like let's let another woman get put in danger. Well, so we and can catch him in the act. Particularly that they were okay with letting these First Nations women be put in danger yeah. again. Because it's not like, oh, let's catch him, you know, robbing a liquor store. No. Nope. Let's, te- let's catch him brutally assaulting a First Nations woman. Yeah. Shame on them, actually. I feel like we're always constantly bashing our police. We do love them, but looking back, hindsight is so much easier than actually being involved in the moment of the investigation, right? And the choices that they're oh, making. Oh, absolutely. But yeah. no, yeah, we love our the- police force. We're pro police. We support you. We love you we appreciate you but sometimes the ball gets dropped yeah and this just seems like one of those things where i think they could have found a better way okay let me go on to tell what happened okay so at 8 p.m on october 11th so this is roughly within two weeks of finding the bodies they've got him already under surveillance so they know pretty much right away that he's their man at 8 p.m on october 11th 1994 there is a police report of john taking Teresa Kimach a visibly intoxicated woman, into his car and driving her to a storage lot. The surveillance vehicle followed, and even though they suspected John of brutally raping and murdering three other women, they didn't intervene when he beats and rapes Teresa. What? Yeah. They see him do this? So there's some discrepancies about whether the police were they actually aware of what was going on inside the car. It's speculated that because of their close proximity and the reason they were actually doing the surveillance, that how could they not know what was no. going on inside the car? If he's under surveillance, they're watching every single thing that he's doing. Yeah. But the official line is, is that they were unaware as to what was happening. What is reported is that when John kicks her out of the car and takes off, the police take Teresa into custody. No. Yeah. The police say that they had put Teresa into an overnight holding cell in hopes that she would be more forthcoming about what had happened in the car. Because originally, when they had went to go and get her up, she denied being raped when the police had questioned her. And so they had hoped that if they put her in an overnight holding cell, they didn't actually arrest her, that it would convince her to give them more incriminating evidence against John to build a case. But she wasn't cooperative. No, she probably felt like she was being treated like a criminal. Yeah, who honestly like a victim. Is, yeah, who honestly is going to trust the people that you believe just watched you be raped and beaten? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's all kinds of wrong. Yeah. After that, police move on to a more direct method of getting concrete evidence against John. They employ Bill to be an informant and pay him to wear a wire. And it's like $15,000 that they pay him. 
Wow. It's, yeah, it's a good business being a police informant, apparently. During his interactions with John, Bill wears a wire, and over a period of four months, the police build a solid case against him, which includes recorded confessions for all three bodies that they found. Oh, good. Yeah. Good job, Bill. No? One of, You're looking at me like, no, yeah, don't say that he's yet. Still, no, no. He's, he's still a dirtbag. He's too. still a dirtbag. But if he helps get this dirtbag off the street, then that's good. Yeah. The way in which they get these confessions is still looked upon poorly by a lot of people. The police knowingly let John and Bill continue on their former antics of picking up sex trade workers and engaging in drugs and alcohol with young First Nations women in an effort not to disrupt Bill's cover and make John feel more at ease to answer Bill's probing questions when they tried to get him to confess on record. So they're still going about all their old things that they did. So they carry on and they're drunk and they're using drugs. They're picking up these sex trade workers, beating them and using them. And that's where these all these confessions come from. That's deplorable, honestly. Yeah. Like, were they just trying to rack up the numbers so they'd have a better case? Like, these are actual women. These are actual victims. There should not be one more victim. Yeah. But they say that because they needed those confessions, that's why they allowed it to occur. Crazy, right? Not good enough. No. And you wonder why it wasn't reported in the media. Yeah. Zero out of ten. It would have been all over the place. Yeah. Based on Bill's statements, the wiretap worn by Bill... And John's affidavits, this is the account of what had led to those three women's deaths. Shortly after his stay in the hospital, two years previous in the summer of 1992, when he had checked himself out, while out trolling one night with his trusty friend Bill, they met up with Shelley Napope. Prior to going out that night, John had injected Ritalin intravenously for a high. Oh, wow. After driving around for a bit and making a couple of stops, John drove the three of them out to a recently developed area called the Moon Lake Golf and Country Club, an area not far from the shores of the South Saskatchewan River or Paradise Beach. And remember, Paradise Beach was where he had been found after he raped that other woman. Right. He drove them to a clearing that had been used for parties and at different times traditional ceremonies for the First Nations people of the area. Bill Corrigan, in his later testimony, would say that John ordered him to take a walk. He was familiar with John's games and so didn't object. There are some reports that Bill himself took part in the rape and the beating of Shelley, but he adamantly denies having anything to do with stabbing her. He reports that he waited in the car while John dragged a hysterical 16-year-old into the bushes. All the time, John was yelling at her about getting sex for free because he had supplied her with beer. Remember that transaction feeling of like, well, he paid for something, so she should be giving him something. Oh, he's terrible. And Bill, honestly, is just as guilty. If you're sitting in the car knowing that this is happening, I'm sorry, you're an accessory. Yeah, and should be charged as such. Instead, he is the informant and doesn't nothing happens to him so that's another thing with the police letting this guy get off on everything that he's done so crazy so there in the bushes john stabbed her repeatedly in the stomach with a knife that he had taken from bill earlier that day the two men then covered her body with dead tree branches and drove back into town john threw shelly's clothes in a dumpster they passed and they returned to the slums of saskatoon looking for another woman to have sex with oh According to Bill's testimony, John had wanted to return to Shelley's body and knock out her teeth to avoid <gasps> the body being identified. Oh. But they ran out of time before John's 9 p.m. curfew. Oh my gosh. This is all kinds of messed up. Seriously. So messed up. Okay, a man who can do this, stabbing this poor girl to death, wanting to knock out her teeth, and then is like, sorry, Bill, I have to go home. My mommy said I have to be home by nine. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So What bad. a low life. Right? Dirt bag. It is believed that his next victim was taken September 20th. John picked up Ava Tasap at the Berry Hotel. According to John's sign affidavit, he and Ava had a few drinks together and then went to an old cement factory where they continued to get high on pot and Valium and had consensual sex at least three times. Yeah, right. Yeah. Why? Because he bought her a beer? That's right. (laughs) It wasn't until 5 a.m. when Ava wanted to return to the downtown section of the city that she demanded to be paid for the sex. She wanted $150 and John didn't want to pay any more than 50. When he refuses, Ava threatens to go to the police and John admits to losing his temper and strangling her to death. In his signed statement, he said, I remember just holding on to her because I didn't want to go to jail. He would later write, I remember her hands on my arms trying to get me loose and her stomach moving up and down. And I remember thinking, she's only worth $50. I'm not going to jail. She has no right to live. Oh my gosh. So he would rather kill her than pay the extra $100. Yeah. To him, she just was not worth it. Wasn't worth it. Oh, that is sick. 
Yeah. She was only worth $50. Oh. He tried to hide the evidence this time by putting the woman's lifeless body into the trunk of his car, driving to the outskirts of town where he tried to dismember her body, stopping after just one arm. Apparently it was too much work to saw, like he sawed off one arm and then stopped after that. <gasps> this guy. John instead decides to wrap her body in a blanket, an extension cord, and bury her in a shallow grave near the Moon Lake Golf Course. Less than 24 hours later, on September 21st, John took 22-year-old Catalinda Waterhen to the old cement factory. So oh. same place again within 24 hours. Oh my gosh, so no cooling off period. No. At the cement factory, John says the two partied with drugs, alcohol, and sex. This time, he states that Catalinda demanded he pay an additional $55 to the price that they had already agreed upon for her services, or else she would go to the police and say that he had abducted her. <gasps> he again became enraged that she would try to use him for money and strangled her to death. He drove Catalinda's body to the same place that he had put Ava's the day before and covered her with just a pile of leaves. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that really happened or if he was just lying and making up this excuse. Well, oh, he wanted more knows? money, so I had to do it. Yeah. Who knows what happened? Because this is his, his confession, account. right? And you can already see through his numerous other dealings with his psychologist that he admits to lying to other psychologists That's and true. working things yeah, to his own event. Yeah. The defining moment in his recorded confession came when he mentioned to Bill being worried about the body he wrapped with an extension cord. The police knew that this was their guy because they had never released that information to the media. So the mm. police were recording all these conversations, waiting for something that would definitively like, yes, we've got him for this. To this was it. To it. Yeah. Okay. It was something only the murderer would know. John was arrested on January 19th, 1995 for the murders of Shelley Napope, Ava Tasap, and Catalinda Waterhen. After his arrest, numerous other women came forward to tell police about how John had beat and raped them. Police also believed that he was responsible for the disappearance of Shirley Lone Thunder and Cynthia Baldhead, but lacked the evidence to prove a conviction. I have the feeling that there's probably way more victims oh. than they think, because if he had murdered Shelley, wanting to go back and knock out her teeth and wanting to go pick up another girl that same night, and then also only waiting 24 hours between victims, he was on a rampage. Yeah. And it was a nightly thing for him to go yeah. and troll. Yeah. There's probably so many other victims. And unfortunately, the population of the victims was one that they're so often reported missing. Were the police taking those missing persons reports seriously? No, not serious enough. Yeah. There is speculation that John was also responsible for the death of Janet Sylvester, who disappeared October 12th, 1994, and was found a day later not far from the other bodies, with a bag over her head having been suffocated to death. And she's the one that had previously accused John of rape in 1992. Right. Oh, I'm sure he did that. Well, Especially if she was found by the other bodies. That's his dump site. It's his dump He's ground. not creative enough yeah. to find multiple places. But John confessed to all the other murders, the the four other ones. But this one, he absolutely denies. I don't believe it. Especially because he had already raped her. Yeah. It's crazy. But he was under surveillance, too. Yeah, but they watched, watched him, him under surveillance, raping yeah. women and beating women. And didn't do anything it would do yeah. about it. His trial began May 21st, 1996, and his defense team would try a few different tactics. At first, John tried to claim that it was actually Bill that had committed the murders. Oh, of course he did. Yeah. And when that didn't work, he made the claim that the murders had been accidental. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't say that the green, green topless women came and told him. <laughs> but because of the recorded confessions, the jury didn't believe any of his claims yeah nice try in one recorded session played for the jurors in the court it reveals john discussing the weather and the details of shelley's death in the same tone of voice what? his voice really only changes when bill corrects him about shelley's name and john perks up and says oh i thought her name was angie oh <gasps> So that's the Angie that he had told him about. Bill had actually been trying to turn him into the police without letting his friend know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This does remind me of the Robert Hansen case that we did last week. Just mm -hmm. total disregard for these women and their worth as human beings yeah. and just totally disregard for their lives. These women he killed meant nothing to him. It seemed like he didn't even give the people a second thought. Yeah. If you can talk about the weather and this woman that you murdered in the same breath and yeah. not even change your tone. That's scary. John was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. His total disregard for each woman is something that the trial judge pointed out in John's sentencing. So when Judge Wright imposed the maximum limit of 25 years without a chance of parole in all three cases, he said, 
I would make it longer if I could. Mm. You seem determined to remove every vestige of humanity from these women. You have shown no remorse, no regret. This is one of the most disturbing cases I have ever seen. True words right yeah. there. But very, very little in the media about it. And that's so wrong. Mm -hmm. John was remanded in the Regional Psychiatric Center in connection with the Saskatoon Penitentiary. On June 16, 2020, John died at the age of 58 while in custody. And to this day, no cause of death has been released to the public. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that is is interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder what happened there. And I'm still shocked at how little coverage this case has received. I am just floored. I am too. Being a Canadian, living through those years, I didn't hear a thing. Why do you think these murder cases caught so little attention? Why do some get so much and why do others get like next to nothing? And is there a right amount of attention for media? Because I know there's always like people that say that it's too hard for the families or the victims' families to always be in the media. But like if the victims aren't mentioned at all, then it just seems so sad that these three women died and nobody even noticed. That is true. There's There needs yeah. to be a balance. And I, maybe it goes individually what people yeah. would prefer. Some people want their family members who are victims. They want their stories to be heard and raise awareness. But then is there a fine line between you know, the press being at them all of the time and people, you know, just not letting them grieve. And is it how we said at the beginning, because I have heard this in other cases too, where there's a big media case and then so other cases aren't even heard of. Yeah. Like with the Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. And I remember recently looking at a certain case that I was shocked that wasn't talked about. And it was the same time as David Berkowitz or the son of Sam was going on. Okay. And so this one wasn't reported hardly at all and was just as terrible. But But the media took the son of Sam and ran with that one. But what decides what... Which one the media grabs a hold of, right? I don't know. Because this one to me is just as disturbing as what Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka did. And yet... Oh, definitely. Yeah. And yet didn't make the media nearly as much as them. And so was it their victims? So Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka's victims were white, you know, middle class young girls. And John's victims were First Nations women. Was that the difference? Who were down on their luck and already forced to work Yeah, in the sex trades. That were already so vulnerable. But look how they treated Teresa. They just threw her into the holding tank. Yeah. You don't do that to a victim normally. Definitely not if you're trying to get them to, to help you out with the case. Right. Where if this was a white middle class girl, would they have thrown her into the holding tank? Yeah, probably not. That he had just picked up at a superstore or something? No. And along with those lines, do you think it's okay? Because this happens in multiple cases. He could have faced more rape charges. They knew of at least three more women that they suspected him of killing. And yet the investigation just kind of stopped after these three. They didn't look for any more evidence. They didn't try to convict for those other crimes. And so how did those people get justice? Yeah, I feel like that is an injustice. Is that right? I also see the other side of it, though, that it's expensive to hold trials. It's, it's expensive to put police out looking for evidence when the, their sentence isn't going to change or their outcome isn't going to change. That is right? true. Yeah. So where do you put your resources? Do you do it on these cases that haven't been solved, but you're pretty sure he's done that? And Mm -hmm. you know that he's in jail and isn't going to continue doing it. Or you put the resources on current cases and trying to put someone to jail. Right. But then how is that justice for those other women and those other families? And so it's just interesting. Like, what would be the proper thing to do? Do you still keep going after those convictions? Or do you wash your hands up and be like, oh, that one's taken care of. On to the next. Because there is a next one. There's always another dirtbag. There's always another one. So let's put it out to our listeners. What actually attracts the media's attention And should we actually be going after convictions for all of these other cases? Go to our Facebook page, Buried Motives, and let us know what you think. It's always interesting to find out what other people's opinions are on these things. Yeah, we make a post about every case. So that's where you can go on and comment and interact with us and with each other. And next week is Thanksgiving here in Canada. So if you need an excuse to get out of your dinner, you're not going to want to miss my next case. (laughs) it'll make you second guess going to your thanksgiving dinner (laughs) check us out next week have a great one bye right. <laughs> <laughs>
That's right. Hey, I took your line. Hey, you did. <laughs> I was supposed to say that part. Okay. <laughs> okay, you go. You just said you say that part. <laughs> or I throw in a little caca. <laughs> then I know to edit it. Okay, I knew that wasn't right. I was just going to go along with whatever you said. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's all about the boobs, right? But you see or, again. Or the bushes. <laughs> boobs and bushes, everybody. Boobs and bushes. Let's put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> or a sticker. <laughs> Just green. <gasps> a brick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm spitting. Okay. <laughs> there she's yawning. <laughs> or sorry, after. Sorry, John. John's after. Oh, <laughs> few different tatric tractricks 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 get that tractor on the tractor (laughs) ron swanson that's the name ron swanson that's what he looks like (laughs) 